everyone. Um, I will start off by saying thank you all for wearing a mask. I may stop to cough. That is not the COVID. That's just the way my voice box works these days. So <laughs> have a little gravelly voice, but I will try to project enough and go slowly enough that everyone can hear me. As Sarah said, my name is Jenny Karens. I'm really happy to be here today with you at the Hancock Historical Museum or on your computer screen. Hi, Zoomers. I am going to speak today about women's study clubs or women's learning clubs, and I'm going to do that in three parts. First, I'm going to begin by discussing exactly what a women's study club is and what it's not. Then I'm going to go over some of the history of the women's study club movement and its heyday. And finally, I'm going to tie this all together by speaking about one particular local club, which is the Thursday Conversational Club. And by the end, I hope to show you how these study clubs have impacted both Finley and the nation as a whole. So for full disclosure, I am a member of the Thursday Conversational Club, which is a women's study club here in Finley. I use the minutes of the Thursday Conversational Club for my master's degree thesis. And while that research was focused on feminist rhetorical practice, um, I discovered also just a lot about the history of women's clubs and how huge and encompassing it is. Um, so I read minutes from the Thursday Club. I skimmed minutes from other local clubs. And I also read about 30 books and articles about the women's study club movements. And I've brought some of my favorites today. We may have some show and tell later. Um, so that was a pretty good sample, but it was just a sample. But I do feel like I know a lot about the women's study club movement, and I'm happy to share that with you today. And later, I'm also going to share some of the history of the Thursday Conversational Club, which is based on a piece written by uh, Isabel Blackford in 1993. And she was a descendant of the club's foundress. Let's make sure all our tech works. If I forget to, like if it's on a slide for a really long time, <laughs> let me know. So what is a women's study club or a women's learning club or a literary society? I tend to use the terms women's study club and women's learning club interchangeably, but many of the early clubs were also called literary societies because their main objects of study were works of literature. Some clubs still have that focus today. But briefly, a women's study club is one that organized for two purposes, to be a social organization for women, as all clubs by their nature are social, and secondly, to have members conduct a program at each meeting that was educational in nature. These clubs are private in that they do not advertise, and one must be asked to join by a member. But otherwise, they have few requirements for membership other than the desire to contribute to the goals of their organization. Many women's study clubs gain secondary purposes over the time, over time. In fact, almost every <coughs> single one that I've researched also have philanthropic and civic activities. But the primary function of a women's study club is to help members educate themselves through a program or presentation and then to discuss that program and presentation amongst themselves and throughout their greater community. In fact, almost every club has a similar way of operating. Meetings usually begin with a brief business meeting, then the program of the day is held, <coughs> and then there is time for socialization and usually refreshments. <clears throat> Most clubs keep to the Roberts Rules of Order or a similar format and have officers and committee chairs to delegate duties and they keep minutes. That record keeping is very, very important and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Make sure I'm on the right slide. Nope, I'm not yet. Okay. Women's study clubs also help give rise to other women's organizations and so here I will tell you what they are not. First of all, they're local individual clubs, not state or national organizations. While there is a national umbrella organization of women's clubs called the Federation, the majority of modern clubs are not members and they operate individually under their own rules and bylaws. While women's study clubs often have philanthropic endeavors, these clubs are not solely philanthropic or service oriented. So they are not like the junior league or locally the Finley Service League. And while certainly any group of women can be political, they are not only a political organization. So the League of Women Voters or the National Organization of Women do not represent the genre either. And finally, women's clubs do not espouse a specific organization or cause. 
other than their own. So auxiliary organizations like those for hospitals or libraries also do not fit the bill. And lastly, they are also not sororities, which are groups of young women who gather mostly in colleges, and those are based on male fraternities. So while each of these clubs are certainly linked to the greater history of women's organizations, and they certainly hold, hold similar historical backgrounds, I'm gonna focus solely on women's study clubs, and also only the ones that have been around for 100 years or more. And now you are probably thinking, this is going to be a really short talk, <laughs> because how many of these clubs can possibly be in existence? And my answer is thousands. Literally, there is no known way to calculate how many of these clubs existed over time and how many are still in existence today. Just here in Findlay, Ohio, I personally know people who are members of the Thursday Club, of Coterie, of Meridian, and of Arts and Letters who are all, which all have 100 year or more histories and are all still active today. And if you know another club in the area that fits my description, I would love to talk to you. Shakespeare. But Shakespeare is not just women, is it? Yes. It is Shakespeare Club. I was misinformed. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. That's five. <clears throat> So in 2015, a journalist named Ann Costello published a book called Smart Women, I've got a copy right there, The Search for America's Historic All Women Study Clubs. And she interviewed women in over 100 clubs in just 12 small geographic areas. Finley was not one of them. In fact, she only interviewed one place in Ohio and that was near Worcester that had, I think, four or five clubs in that area. So each of the clubs that she mentions fit her criteria of a 100-year continuous membership, independent of any other group, required members to take turns delivering original papers, programs, or for arranging educational presentations, and still had active membership today. She estimates that there could be 10,000 such clubs throughout the United States still holding active meetings. And if you consider her small sample size, that certainly seems possible. But unfortunately, it's impossible to know or how to categorize these clubs or how many simply give up every year. Because as I've said before, they don't usually advertise, they don't have web pages, they don't really belong to any sort of an umbrella organization or a larger formation. They exist through word of mouth and personal invitation. And membership is often extended from generation to generation. And as the primary goals of the clubs continue to be education and socialization, most do not seek any outside recognition except in terms of keeping their membership active. The reward of the club is its own internal success. In fact, many clubs still abide by mottos developed in the Victorian age. <coughs> mottos like, to read and study the best literature and to promote the interchange of thought and opinion among members. That's the motto of the Casmian Club in Springfield, Massachusetts. Or, knowledge rare, we seek and share. That is the motto of the Women's Reading Club of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Or, to enlarge the mental horizon as well as the knowledge of our members. And that's the motto of the Fort Knightley Club in Chicago. So a little aside, the Fort Knightley Club in Chicago is still in existence. They have a web page. Somewhere along the line, they got a lot of money because they have a huge building in downtown Chicago that serves as their clubhouse. But they still follow the traditional women's study club formula of becoming a member by invitation only. Their web page explains how you can become a member. You have to be introduced to another member, holding programs that are educational, and serving to help their members become better members of the community as a whole. <clears throat> so, how did it all get started? No known origin story for America's Women's Study Clubs exists, although Theodora <coughs> Martin attempts to give a really thorough history in her book, The Sound of Our Voices, Women's Study Clubs from 1860 to 1910. I use this book a lot. <laughs> Surely, as long as there have been settlements, groups of women have organized time to work or to socialize together. 
In the many books and articles available about the history and habits of women's study clubs, all agree with Martin's supposition that the mid-19th century was the beginning of the era of these organizations. Martin proposes in her introduction that was, there was apparently no catalyst or event that led to the springing up, apparently from nowhere, women's study clubs spread across American scene in the late 1860s, gathering momentum and increasing in number through the early 1890s. Almost completely white and middle or upper middle class in membership, these small local groups had various criteria for membership and a desire to meet to study art, music, history, geography, and literature. There are many other books and articles written about the women's club movement, and while there is no absolute consensus about how this movement began or grew to be so vast, <coughs> scholars and historians commonly agree that there were four events or movements that influenced or occurred simultaneously with the women's club movements that worked hand in hand to establish these clubs. And I personally categorize these in four ways. The idea, the opportunity, the moral obligation, and finally the legal recognition. So remember <coughs> not long ago, like in the time of my grandmother's mother and certainly my grandmother's grandmother, women had very few rights or opportunities. They received very little education and had few instances where they could work outside the home. And in fact, women were rarely encouraged to even think of things that existed outside of the home. But gradually, mostly between the 1860s and the 1890s, but continuing even until the 1960s, women's study clubs grew and grew, and so did the greater purview of women in general. So I'm gonna briefly go over these four events that might explain the how and why um, the women's club movement occurred and grew. And please understand that I'm really just glancing over very historic and important historic events, and I'm narrowing the focus to how they pertain to my topic, but here goes. <coughs> Concept one is the idea. The Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 was the very first ever women's convention. It was advertised as a convention to discuss <coughs> the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women. One of the primary goals of this convention was to discuss suffrage for women, but that took you know, another 70 years. <laughs> but the real consequence of the Seneca Falls Convention was that it gave women the idea that they could gather in groups for a common purpose. This was a really new and interesting idea in a time where women rarely left their <coughs> home sphere. Next, I have the opportunity. This is Clara Barton, who founded the American Red Cross. The opportunity came with the abolitionist movement and the Civil War. So once women had the idea that they could organize and speak on their own behalf, someone else had the idea that maybe women could organize and speak on behalf of others. And thus, women became a big part of the abolitionist movement to abolish slavery. And as an aside, the abolitionist movement is really the very first place in time where women spoke in public, especially to audiences that had both men and women. Um, lots of books written about that too. <laughs> um, and certainly I think that helped spark the advent of women's clubs. And then when the Civil War broke out, women suddenly had opportunities due to necessity, the necessity to organize hospitals and organize supplies and even do the work of daily life in the absence of male soldiers who had gone to war. These gave women the opportunity to go beyond the traditional roles assigned to them. It's no surprise that so many of the women's study clubs started in the decade following the Civil War. So speaking of traditional roles, the cult of domesticity and true womanhood another great topic with many books written about it, was the main school of thought about the role of women throughout the 1800s. The idea was that women were the defender of the hearth and home, they should have no ambitions other than family and their traditional roles. But in the late 1800s, there was a shift toward women being also the defenders of morals. 
and the temperance movement, which aimed at ridding the country of the scourge of alcohol, provided another venue for women to gather and organize while still maintaining their roles as a lady. And thus, it provided moral grounds for women to gather for a purpose. And finally, the legal rights. By the late 1800s and the early 1900s, women had pretty much decided that they could just learn and organize and plan and speak just as effectively as men. And the success of the suffrage movement, you know, this week was the first time, or it was a 100 year anniversary of the first time women could vote in a presidential election, so not that long ago. But the success of that movement showed again how women began to obtain those legal rights to vote, educate, and employ themselves. So each of these events are, of course, all massive and worthy of their own study, but I wanted you to see how they all each contributed to or became a part of the Women's Study Club movement, or how the Women's Study Club movement opened the door for these events to occur. So prior to the Civil War, almost every woman's organization was either an auxiliary of a men's organization or a religious aid society. But in 1868, a woman named Jane Crowley, there's Jane, started a club named Cirrhosis in New York City, and it became the blueprint for women's study clubs to follow all across the country, which they did somehow almost simultaneously. Within a year, there were dozens of similar clubs in the Northeastern United States. Women's study clubs, all designed with the goal of learning, began to spring up across the mid-Atlantic states, the Midwest, the South during Reconstruction, and as the citizens of the United States moved westward, the women's study clubs moved westward with them. Julia Ward Howe, who is the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, was also the founder of the New England Women's Club, and she traveled all over the country, encouraging women to form their own independent study clubs. So other than personal visits, the women's club movement was spread in the 19th <clears throat> century version of social media. Essentially it's the theory of social circulation, which I printed here, the overlapping social circles in which women travel, live, and work are carried on or modified from one generation to the next and can lead to change rhetorical practices. But basically what it means is that women talked to each other. A member of one club told her <coughs> friend, who wrote to her sister, who asked her neighbor to help her start a club. Or a, women started a group of women started a club about literature, and then part of that group broke off to start a different club that's focused on art. Individual clubs organized officially and kept, kept detailed records of their articles of agreement, their bylaws, and their meeting minutes, all of which to help keep the movement moving forward as clubs shared their own materials with other clubs. Many 21st century clubs today are still running on just moderately updated bylaws that were written in the Victorian era. Another interesting facet of the proliferation of women's study clubs are the fact that the clubs grew more numerous rather than simply attracting more members. As these clubs were focused on programs designed by and given for their own members, the space in which they met was most frequently a member's home. This limited the membership to the amount that could comfortably be accommodated within a home, and most women's study clubs had membership limits of 20 to 25 people. And new members were sought only if there was an opening, opening due to moving, death, or the odd resignation. And as it is another aside, I found this very interesting, there was also a trend around the turn of the 20th century where clubs held their membership firm even after the members began to pass away. One such club, which was just called The Bee in Cambridge, Massachusetts, had only, it was formed, I think, 1865, and it had only nine living members left in 1900. And this book has a beautiful picture that I could not take another picture of, of the, the nine living members of the Bee in 1900. <clears throat> and it says in their minutes, no effort is made to increase membership, the club having arrived at that condition of acquaintance where it seems like a family and <coughs> hesitate at taking in strangers. So I just thought that was precious. So membership 
in these women's study clubs was almost always exclusively white and Protestant, although there were also some notations of African-American women starting their own clubs in the segregated South near the turn of the 20th century. Clubs started out with mostly married women whose children were primarily out of the house and then often incorporated the adult daughters of those women. But by the 1880s, young unmarried ladies began to start their own clubs like the Saturday Morning Club in Boston, about which an article was written in the Boston Post, which noted, clubs are on the increase. The latest of these is the Young Ladies Club that meets every Saturday morning and whose members devote themselves not to the discussion of bows, but to listen to essays and works from the notable men and women of Boston and beyond, and then discuss their meaning. So in a time when young women were encouraged not to venture beyond the dreams of having a family, the idea of discussing out loud notable essays and works was certainly newsworthy. And I just, I love the stuff you can find on the internet. So here are some pictures of their programs from certain meetings that they had. Um, and they also apparently gave a uh, reading of the Winter's Tale at some point in time. So certainly the Women's Study Club movement led its members to form additional clubs that were not devoted to self-education and intellectual improvement. As I mentioned before, once women started collaborating, clubs developed that were totally political in nature or totally philanthropic. Some study clubs even evolved to leave their goals behind and embrace social change rather than just a bi-weekly or a monthly program. However, a great number of women's study clubs simply added on to their original format and developed philanthropic tendencies or civic housekeeping duties in addition to keeping a member-driven program at each meeting. So now that I've gone through what the women's study clubs are and I've given a brief accounting of how they came to be, I'd like to switch to discussing one specific club <coughs> native to Finley, which is the Thursday Conversation Club. Thursday Conversational Club. I need to pause for a drink. <clears throat> what is the Thursday Conversational Club? It's one of the many women's study clubs or women's learning clubs which originated in the second half of the 19th century all across the United States. Formed during the Gilded Age, just before the start of the 20th century, the Thursday Conversational Club and others that started in Finley reflected the economic prosperity of the era and the community. Simply put, young women had the money to have time on their hands and few formalized opportunities to be educated past grammar school. <coughs> Thus, women in these clubs focused on self-education through their organized readings, papers, and programs. As I mentioned before, several clubs still exist in Finley today. And most importantly, however, these clubs organized in a formal way that included the documentation of their activities, both in researching, writing, and creating their programs, but also in the format of meeting minutes. These minutes form the basis of the club's history and the historical volumes for the Thursday Conversational Club are housed here at the Hancock Historical Museum. Current books are kept with current club members. The Thursday Conversational Club was organized in 1893 by Miss Florence Blackford with 15 original members, though the number quickly grew to 23 young single women. Miss Blackford's goal was for young women to have interests in the world around them, not just the search for a husband. According to the Articles of Agreement, members must be single ladies. Meetings were to be held bi-weekly from 2 until 4.30 p.m. Annual dues were set at 50 cents per year. Tardiness was fined with five cents. Absence, barring excuse, was fined with 10 cents. And the failure to perform a scheduled program would cost the member an entire dollar. And I hope I have a dime because I don't think I'm gonna make it to my meeting later this week. <laughs> later tonight. <clears throat> Meetings were originally scheduled for Mondays, but several members had a conflict with another local women's study club, which is unnamed in the minutes. Literally, the name is crossed out. <laughs> so I don't know if they didn't want to name the competition or what. And I held this thing up to the light to try to figure it out. I couldn't read it. 
But by 1896, <laughs> Thursday was the set date, and the name of the club officially became the Thursday Conversational Club. Each club meeting was held in members' home and consisted of the presentation of a program or paper, followed by social discussion time and refreshments. While the club now only meets once a month, this formula is still in place today. The educational focus is obvious in the club's history. In the beginning, members were responsible for planning a paper and presenting it to the membership and then leading the discussion after. Some of the topics in the first few years of the club included comparison between the Gothic and Byzantine architecture, art during the reign of Charlemagne, and major English authors. <laughs> I'm going to whip one of those up for next week. <laughs> While the programs gradually grew less intense, they remained a way for club members to learn about history, art, <coughs> science, and trends outside of Finley, Ohio. So consider this snippet from the minutes of a meeting in 1922. At this time, Mrs. O'Brien presented Mrs. Carpenter, who read the paper of the afternoon on the radio telephone. This very up-to-date subject was of keenest interest to everyone and the paper was listened to with intense pleasure. There are new developments every day, and Mrs. Carpenter presented in her paper the newest and most interesting of these. Sometimes the program consisted of a dramatic reading, as noted in 1933. They read from the play De Classe by Joe Atkins and played by Ethel Barrymore. The reading was listened to with great enjoyment, and afterward, a lively discussion of the play followed. Or here is something from 1953, where members themselves became works of art. The meeting was then turned over to Mrs. Arnold, who read a most interesting paper on the life and work of Edgar Dea. Throughout the reading of the paper, live tableau depicting the artist's paintings were shown. <laughs> At the conclusion of this delightful program, tea was served with Mrs. Child and Mrs. Elsie pouring. Can't you just see women Posing like a big out painting. <laughs> I love it. As time passed, the programs evolved to have speakers and experts from outside the club to share information about topics from antique clocks to interior decorating to architecture and even slideshows of pictures from people's trips to Europe and Asia. And musical programs, be they vocal, instrumental, or both, were consistently a favorite of the club over the years, with both club members and community members providing the program. <clears throat> More recently, the club has adjusted from the traditional home setting to having meetings held in community locations. Just in my short time in the Thursday Conversational Club, we visited First Presbyterian Church, the Hancock County Courthouse, the Marathon Center for the Performing Arts, Can Do Studio, the University of Finley, the Hancock Historical Museum, <laughs> and many other locations around town to learn about Finley's history and future. The program component is a key feature of a women's study club like the Thursday Conversational Club. However, even in the beginning, it wasn't all papers and programs. Socialization has always been a big part of Thursday Club and other women's study clubs. In addition to an educational program and discussion at the regular meetings, the Thursday Conversational Club began to host social events. For example, the club hosted the Fort Wayne Orchestra at the Marvin Opera House in 1896, charging a small fee for the public to attend. Other social activities noted in the minutes included an Easter party with gentlemen friends, and a June picnic outing with gentlemen friends, and a Halloween evening entertainment game of hide and seek with club members hiding and their gentlemen friends seeking. <laughs> and as you can probably surmise by 1907, a change was necessary in the Constitution that changed Article I from only unmarried women are eligible for membership to any woman the club sees fit to act upon is eligible for membership. Club members may have been encouraged to look beyond simply finding a husband, but those husbands were bound to be found. And while Ms. Blackford may have originally wished for members of the Thursday Conversational Club to have aspirations outside of family life, club members did not wish to lose friends simply because they married or had children. 
Um, so like many similar clubs, adjustments were made to avoid excluding those women who married or became mothers. Thursday Conversational Club also has a long history of philanthropy and civic responsibility. Since its, yeah, since its inception, the club has had a Christmas fund that has gone through several evolutions. The first year of the club's existence, they held a Christmas party for needy girls, no older than 10, where the club provided a decorated tree and gave each child a doll, a sack of candy, a popcorn ball, an orange, and a box of provisions. The costs of the party were mainly covered through donations from club members, though the club treasury was charged 45 cents for the Christmas tree and $1 for the candy. The custom of a party included and it continued until 1923 when the club decided to have a more general donation instead of a party. That year, the club voted to give equipment to the new pediatric ward at the hospital. Other years, a collection was taken up for a particularly needy family, probably one nominated by a member. In 1932, during the Great Depression, the minutes note, $28.08 was the total amount given to Mrs. J for Christmas gifts. A discussion followed as to the wish of the club in contributing to the filling of baskets for other needy families. Currently, the club budgets for a Christmas donation and has a committee that suggests recipients for a vote by the club. In recent years, the club budgets $500 from the dues to a nonprofit organization nominated by that Christmas committee and then collects private donations from members both to add to that and or to provide physical goods. Continuing in the philanthropic vein, the Thursday Conversational Club has always engaged in what scholars call civic housekeeping, or projects that benefit the community. For example, in 1942, almost all club activities were suspended so that members could use the time for the meeting to volunteer at Red Cross headquarters in downtown Finley. Members were usually assigned to the bandage room where they compiled comfort kits to be distributed to soldiers fighting in the European or Asian fronts. The club secretary still took role. You were still fined if you didn't show up. <laughs> and they recorded what activities the ladies were set for each session of the Red Cross. The desire of the club to support learning and study also crosses over into civic engagement as the club donated four books to the YMCA library in 1987. <laughs> and in 1936, they established the Florence Blackford Memorial Shelf at the recently opened Finley Public Library, whereon a book would be donated and placed for each member of the club after she passed away. That practice was continued until the 1970s. Also over the years, the club has contributed funds to Finley College to help with tuition for female students and to many other scholarship funds, especially those for young women. The minutes reflect that the Thursday Conversational Club rarely refused an opportunity to either volunteer, organize, or donate for a cause while still maintaining a monthly educational program for its members. Of course, times change and clubs change with it. Of interest to me, when I was researching the minutes was how much money has changed in the 125 plus years of the club's existence. I've already mentioned the 45 cent Christmas tree and the really hefty amount of $28.08 as enough to purchase Christmas food and presents for a whole family in 1932. But there are also examples of how the club arranged its own finances. For example, in the 1982 club year, they did a lot of internal organizing. They amended the Constitution, applied for a federal tax number, and reorganized the club banking. That section of the minutes concludes with this comment. Motion was made that we change our savings account at the First National Bank to the NOW account, paying five and one quarter percent interest and no service charges. So I'm pretty sure we're, nobody's earning five and a quarter percent interest on a savings account right now. I've lived in Finley for 15 years and there's been significant growth and change in just that time, particularly in downtown. And as Finley changes, so does the Thursday Conversational Club, but the core tenets of the club remain the same. It is a group of women who are interested in each other our community, 
and in learning more about the world around us. While members no longer wear hats and gloves to every meeting, we still conduct our programs and meetings with Robert's Rules of Order. We still have a program designed to inform, enlighten, or entertain at each and every meeting. And there's ample evidence that the club will probably continue to do so in years to come. And that evidence is found here in the ledgers that contain the minutes, the newspaper clippings, photographs, and other memorabilia of the Thursday Conversational Club. Quite literally, if we didn't have those records, we wouldn't know the clubs existed. And that's why it's impossible to categorize. How many people have a trunk in their attic that has great grandma's club minutes in it? Who knows? These written records are truly the evidence of how women's study clubs, like the Thursday Conversational Club, or Coterie, or Meridian, or Shakespeare Club, or countless others, have shaped our community by making their members more educated and performed participants of the community. The books alone are worth a lecture or two, and if you multiply these endeavors by the handful of clubs in Finley, or the hundreds or the thousands of clubs that are found all over the United States, I think you can see how influential the Women's Learning Club movement was and how it still is today. In fact, the minutes of a women's learning club are an example of feminist rhetoric. They illustrate the trends of the National Women's Club movement. They identify feminist historiographic practices, and most importantly, they show community and collaboration of women. They are the records of over 100 years of women's history. And we're still going. The Thursday Conversational Club is in its third century of membership. And we continue to meet on the first Thursday of the month from October through May. And that concludes my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, if any of you on Zoom have a question, please go ahead and put that in the chat box and we will relay the question to Jenny. And also if anybody here has yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenny, at yes. this, this point, how does someone become a member? I'm assuming you have to be invited instead you of You do, yes. Um, most of the membership of the Thursday Conversational Club just comes from, we have a set membership in order to keep the meetings manageable. We have active and inactive members. Um, so sometimes as ladies get older or maybe they start to spend the winter in Florida or something, they go on our inactive list. And so as we have openings, basically any member can nominate somebody to become a member. Then there's a secret vote, but really there's not. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, yes. Jenny. Mm -hmm. How did you decide to do your thesis on this particular topic, which um, I find fascinating? It is a fascinating <laughs> topic. It was kind of a, a, a big conglomeration of a lot of interesting things. I mentioned to my children's piano teacher, I don't even know how it came up, but I said, oh, my grandma used to belong to all these clubs. I couldn't tell you the name of any of them or what they did, but I'm sure they were all women's study clubs. And my children's piano teacher, a lovely lady named Eleanor McCoy, said, oh, well, I belong to some clubs. And then a few months later, she said, would you be interested in learning more about one of them? And so she nominated me for membership into Thursday Club. And then I, was, I went back to school and was getting my master's degree, and I was trying to find a topic for my thesis. And um, I started talking about this club and how they keep these meticulous minutes. And now... The secretary types it all down, but then still hand transcribes mm -hmm. in handwriting the minutes into a big ledger book. And I just found this fascinating. And one of my very smart professors who's sitting right here said, boy, that sounds like something that'd be really interesting to research for a thesis. And she was right. It was, it was absolutely incredible. I sat upstairs on that chair for, I say, I'm just going to spend 90 minutes. And then three hours later, you know, you're... And I think the thing about it, too, that's so interesting to me is it's one book with 75 authors. You know, and each secretary left her own little stamp. Mm -hmm. Even though they're all in minutes format, some of them are funny, and some mm -hmm. of them are very cut and dry. Mm 
Some of them had horrible handwriting. <laughs> you know, and there's there's just so much too when you read between the lines. You know, in this month's meeting it says we're going to do this, and then you can tell there was this big discussion because in the next month's minutes, no, they did that. And that's the part of it that was just amazing to me that how there's this continuing circle of writing and talking and discussing and writing and talking and discussing that goes on for you know now 127 years. Pretty cool. Okay, we have a potentially very long question here. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of thank yous and good job, Jennies. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for the fascinating talk and finishing a biography of James Purdy, who grew up in Finley. He wrote a novel called On Glory's Course that is based on Finley from 1929 to 1930 and features a character based on Nell Baker. Huh. She was a charter member of the Symposium and the Thursday Conversational Club. Have you encountered her name or that of the teacher Mildred Deitch who encouraged James Purdy? <coughs> probably, the answer to that question would be probably. Of course, there are so many members now. We have a memoriam section on the back page of our yearly program that is really almost too full. The names are really tiny anymore. Um, my particular study that I did, I picked 10 club years, one from each decade, from the 1920s to the 1990s. So if she was a member in one of my years, I probably read a lot about her. <laughs> um, if she wasn't, I probably still saw her name somewhere else in there. The amazing thing, too, one of the other places I think you find out about Women's Club is in obituaries. Sometimes you'll read this obituary and it will say, she was a member of Symposium, which is a that's a couples club. Well, she was a member of the Thursday Conversational Club. And um, the person who, Ann Costello, when she wrote this book, she wrote this book on a very happenstance kind of a way, but that was how she tried to find more clubs in a particular area. If she would start scouring obituaries to see if they mentioned them. Okay. He had a, another mm -hmm. thing. Purdy said Adele Bevington was based on a real woman that he knew as a young boy for whom he ran errands. <laughs> She gave him books to read, books that were over his head. The woman was a fin Finley native, Nell Baker, head librarian and journalist who was the society editor for the Morning Republican and on the editorial department of the Finley Courier. Uh, Purdy noted in his record book in his apartment that Nell Baker was friends with Dr. Charles J. Ray in Gilboa. That's, yeah, the thing that I also think would be so interesting is, so let's say there's 10 clubs in 1912 in Finley and probably most of the members were also members of more than one and how did you work that do you know what I mean how did you Finley's not that big <laughs> you know how would you say well you know Jenny and I are in this club and we're also in this club with this person but we don't want this person to be in our third club you know I mean, <laughs> The social negotiation. I mean, a lot of clubs, but I haven't run into. Yeah, that. I mean, I don't think I don't think it would be as common now for that to happen. But I think you know, back in the day when this is what they had to do. I mean, a lot of these ladies' schedules were based on mm -hmm. these yeah. club meetings. But I mean, a lot of those ladies, I know they're in two or three other clubs. So I think maybe now, if you're in one club, then you invite somebody to be in another club. Yes. Yeah, I think that's true now, and that's I think why there are so many. For sure. <laughs> there was another question. Um, I'm going to try and, and do this from memory, but basically, um, how does the club pay for um, yeah, we pay speakers and different things like that? Um, we have dues. Uh, it was twenty dollars, I think, for a really long time per year, and then we doubled it because one of the big things that we try to do every year is a guest day luncheon where you can bring guests in the spring who might be interested in the club, or we try to have a, a bigger speaker at that meeting. Sometimes we might have to pay an honorarium. Um, so we have dues that cover everything, and we have a treasurer who balances our books. And I think that's pretty common. Hey, I actually got the, the gist of that one entirely. I wanted to make sure I didn't yep. leave out anything. Um, would you be able to discuss issues of class in relation to the Thursday Conversational Club and other Finley clubs? <laughs> Um, sure. Well, as I mentioned, uh, really, I think 
even though a lot of them started in the 1860s, the 1890s was another big period. And the 1890s in the United States, you know, it's called the Gilded Age for a reason. It was a time of great socioeconomic wealth and really one of the first times where there was this kind of upper middle class of, of women who didn't have a lot of stuff to do. They didn't necessarily, they had, you know, housekeepers who took care of their homes and so they had free time. And, and I think that's why a lot of the clubs were established. And certainly, even today, to be the member of the club, you have to have time on a Thursday afternoon. Either you have to not have a job, or you have to have a job that is willing to let you be off to attend a club meeting. So yes, class is a very uh, big indicator of the women's study club movement. Now, that being said, there are elements of the women's study clubs movement particularly for African-American women, um, particularly for immigrant women. You know, Boston had a whole section of clubs that were just Irish, and most of those women tended to be working women, and therefore they met in the evenings. I don't know much else about that. I just read in the side about that. And as we move forward in time, where more women do work outside the home, a lot of clubs do switch things to weekends or to evenings, or they make their meetings quarterly instead of bi-weekly or instead of monthly. But certainly, the uh, luxury of being a part of a social learning club is that you have the time to do it. I don't believe we have any more questions in the chat. Yes, yeah, yeah, but I was wondering in your research, did you come across any men's clubs? Well, yeah. <laughs> she says in your research, did you come across any men's clubs? For sure. I mean, really, that was, I think, the Jane Crowley, who founded Cirrhosis, founded Cirrhosis because she was real annoyed that the Dickens Club in New York City had a speaker and wouldn't let her go. Um, that was her basis for founding Cirrhosis. Well, she said, fine, we'll have our own club and we'll have our own speakers. Um, so yes, and of course, Robert's Rules of Orders were developed for men's clubs to run, and then the women's clubs adopted them. So there's a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.